uh. To whoever may need this nugget of encouragement, things will be all right. So quit your worry. I get it. The What's good, you guys? Welcome back to For the Underdogs podcast. It's crazy. This is actually episode 10. And I feel like we just started. I know we just launched in February, but to be at 10 already, I remember when I first started, we were having conversations about podcasts as a whole. And, you know, the stats were a lot of people don't get to five, let alone 10. And so it's a mini milestone, but it's uh, something to be proud of because I feel like you figure out if people really love this or if they're, you know, just in it because it's hot right now. And to be able to get to 10, like I said, it's a milestone, but it's a mini one. And I'm proud of where we are right now. That being said, today is going to be mainly about reflection. And I do want to talk about some things that I haven't addressed since starting the podcast. I know I've touched on them a little bit, but we're going to reflect and we're going to kind of talk about how we got here as a whole. I appreciate everybody that's been tuning in, obviously, throughout these past 10 episodes. It's been a huge step for me from a standpoint of taking that leap forward and actually physically putting the work in to have a podcast. A lot of work goes into it. And I feel like I haven't touched on how we got here to the extent that I would like to. So I want to touch on that right now, just a little bit on my career and how it ended because I've mentioned it, but I haven't really gotten too deep into it. So my career ended in 2022. And at the time I was playing with the Giants, I had signed a one year deal with them and I had some hesitations about, you know, signing with them in the first place. That's for another day. That's the whole business side of things. But, you know, I had kind of figured that I was towards the tail end of my career. This would be year eight for me that I'm speaking on. I was in year seven when I signed the deal and I am what you would consider a veteran. And so I'm an older guy on the team. And within the back of my mind, you know, as I'm training throughout the off season and things like that, I'm really noticing that my body's a little different this year. You know, I'm not recovering the same as I used to when I was a younger guy. Things are, you know, getting a little harder to to come back from. A, a recovery from a practice may take me, you know, a whole day as opposed to a couple hours or a recovery from a game may take me three days as opposed to bouncing back the next day or the day after that. And so while I was training throughout the off season, I was also battling that realization that I was getting older. My mind was still young from a standpoint of understanding get the game and you know, what football is all about. But when your body starts to kind of give you those signs, it's really humbling for a lot of athletes, I would say. So fast forward to training camp. I'm having a great training camp. I'm playing well. And, you know, when we get to the first preseason game versus the Patriots in the second quarter, I end up injuring my neck. And as all football players do, we want to try to play through injuries and you know, just see how serious it is. A lot of us are playing through injuries without even knowing that we're hurt at the time. And we just kind of push through it. That's just the nature of the game. A lot of guys aren't playing 100% healthy, but I end up injuring my neck in the second quarter and didn't return to the game. And so obviously after that, I ended up getting an MRI. You know, it, it became pretty serious. It was something that I didn't know the severity of it until I got the MRI. And I was told right then and there by a doctor in Los Angeles that I had to retire. And having that conversation right on the spot was just like the huge, the biggest blow that you could have because, you know, I'm going here thinking I'm going to get an opinion on when I can return to play or what my rehab process is going to be like. And he tells me that he wouldn't clear me to play given the condition that my neck is in. So he tells me it's three to six month recovery. And I remember after leaving that appointment, 
you know, I called my agent and I had so many emotions built up because I'd just been told that I can no longer play this game that I played for so long. And I remember calling my agent and telling him, like, I'm done. I don't I don't want to talk about playing anymore. Like I'm checked out, basically. And maybe it was a little premature. Obviously, it wasn't given the results that I got. But for me, if I hadn't have said that to my agent, I feel like I would have left the door open to possibly try to play again. And, you know, there's a lot of guys that get these career ending type injuries and end up finding some type of modality that helps them and they come back and they extend their career. But for me, when I thought about a neck injury and I thought about the severity of it, when a doctor tells you that another hit could possibly have you dealing with paralysis, a whole different mindset kind of sets in. And for me, it was quality of life. Obviously, you want to be able to live your life after the sport and have a quality life. You don't want to be hindered because of an injury. You don't want to not be able to play with your kids or, you know, enjoy yourself on vacation or just go play, you know, basketball at the gym or whatever the case may be. And that whole situation set in differently with me when I thought about not being able to do those things. So like I said, three to six month recovery from then for me, it was tough. It was it was really tough. I'm not going to sugarcoat it because, you know, it was a pinched nerve. It was it was a severely pinched nerve that I had. And that meant I couldn't lift weights, couldn't really run the way I wanted to without that pain starting to revive itself in my neck. And so it just left me basically stationary bike riding. That was what I did for months while I was rehabbing. And my rehab was really extensive. I mean, I was going at least four to five times a week doing rehab exercises, trying to get feeling back in my left hand, trying to get the strength back in my left hand. And it was a neck thing. So to have it all the way down to the fingertips, it is definitely pretty serious when you think of like I said, quality of life post game. So like I said, the decision was made pretty quickly that I was done. And to be honest, I said I was done, but this was the first time that I had that feeling of being my heart telling me one thing, but my mind telling me another, you know, my mind is still in this mindset of you're tough. You can do it. This is just something you'll get past. You've played through plenty injuries before, but within my heart and in my soul, I'm really feeling like this is the end of the road for me. And it's so hard to grasp the concept of that when reality sets in. You know, I'm sure we all have things that we want to continue to do. And whether it's your mind not allowing you to do those things or your body telling you you have to move on from it, it's hard when it it really sets in and you have to move on from those things. And especially with athletes, I feel like, you know, majority of our lives, we've been praised for what we can do physically as well as mentally, but a lot is is physically. So when you think about not having the game, you know, not having something that means so much to you and that validated you for so long. And I feel like that's the, the wrong way to look at things, but a lot of us are conditioned to place our validation in the sport that we perform in. And a lot of us base our performance on how real life things are going. I've I've definitely fallen victim to that of having a bad game. And now I'm thinking within my head, I'm having a bad day, you know, because you place so much pride into these things and you want to put out a good product on a field or on the court, whatever sport you're playing. So it's only human nature for your mind to be tricked into doing that. But to get back on what I was saying, so I spent months and months rehabbing and I really felt like at that point I was just existing. Mind you, it's September, it's football season. So I'm watching games, I'm watching my peers perform and, 
you know, have success and I'm feeling like I'm left out basically because I'm not doing what I love to do. And that was really the first time that I noticed how the world just keeps moving, whether you're in what you want to do or not. You know, there was no stoppage of the NFL because I wasn't in it. And for such a long time, I was having this pity party within myself. I was never telling anyone this, but, you know, I was I was pretty depressed, to be honest, about the way my career ended. And I've spoken on this before of why I have such a hard time of giving myself praise for my career is because I didn't get to walk out on my own terms. You know, a lot of us want to, in the grand scheme of things I did, because I called it quits, you know, but it was because of an injury. And that, that was hard within itself. You know, I know we always hear about guys transitioning out of the league and the difficulties of what that may look like. And for me, it was pretty difficult, you know, not from a standpoint of functioning outside of football, but identity standpoint, like really knowing who I am at the time. And for me, it was eye opening because when you get done playing, a lot of the peers that you thought you would have lifelong relationships with, it's not there anymore. Or a lot of the phone calls that used to get picked up on the first ring, they just don't answer anymore. And why it's so eye opening to me is because when you play, you have this feeling of the connection that you're making with other people or networking with other people is because of the person that you are. But really, at the end of the day, it's because of what you do. And so when you get done playing, it's so hard to transition and realize that those same people don't care about the actual person. It was that relationship was based off of what you did in your career. And so that was a tough part for me. But I think that's something that's needed for all of us, for all of the the athletes and for all the people that that are walking around every day is learning where to place people in their respective positions because sometimes we may place people too high or we may place people too low but when you're really in a time of deciphering that those things really matter because I know now looking at it three years later two years later I know now the real solid relationships that I built just off of the time that's been spent out the league and the people that I've stayed in contact with. And that means a lot because you want to be able to weed out those people that you can't really connect with unless you've been playing the sport still. That's why they want to talk to you. You know, I remember having conversations with my best friend, Patty, and he was telling me at the time of this transition that he feels like I can do anything. And by anything, it was like post-career. What what do you want to do? We were having conversations about what do you want to do post-football? And I was just kind of, you know, still hung up on football, but like, I don't know, but I want to do something, you know? I don't know what I want to do. And he's like, man, I feel like you could do anything. Like, whatever you decide to do, I feel like you can do anything. And to hear that is so reassuring. You know, we've known each other since we were kids, so you know, to know that he sees that in me, it was such a dope feeling to have when you can really talk to someone and get their true opinion. But also the internal conflict of that, of me knowing, yeah, I can do anything, but not knowing where to start, you know, so tied to my identity being a football player, thinking that I have to do something that involves football that was the hardest part to get past when I was thinking about what to do next. So the identity thing is real, man. I think a lot of guys struggle with who they are and what they stand for post football because a lot of or post athletic career, because a lot of what you are so tied to is the sport in which you grew up in. So fast forward into the journey of obviously rehab and still the mental gymnastics started to sit in with me 
of getting anxious, having that that anxiety of life is setting in. I'm starting to feel a little depressed because I haven't figured out where I want to go from here. I don't have this game of football to relate to anymore. I don't have the same friendships that I thought were solid friendships. I'm really navigating real life experiences except later in life. And I think it's like, it's almost like a rebirth stage as an adult, you know, at the time I was around 30 years old or so. And to be in that stage of just now stepping into real life and don't get me wrong, I'm not saying football is not real life and, you know, being an athlete is not real life, but until you're removed from the game and you don't have that to give you the release that you need, I feel like that is when you step into real life. So like I said, the mental gymnastics started to sit in, you know, depression started to sit in, anxiety started to sit in, a lot of resentment started to sit in. And that's when I knew that I had to speak to someone like I needed to go get a therapist to talk to, you know, I'm home a lot more. The the adjustment of me being around all the time was tough, not getting up and having a schedule you know, I think a lot of us go through that phase of like, man, we we're happy when we get to sleep in or whatever. That's not normal for me because I've never been able to really do that. Even within the off season, I'm always up early, but I was feeling sorry for myself. I'm not going to lie. Like, you know, I was throwing my own pity party, which is sometimes you got to do that in order to get through the other side. But that's what it took for me to really understand that I needed to talk to a therapist and really kind of spearhead this thing. And to be quite honest, it was so helpful from a standpoint of getting things out that I was bottling up over years and years and years. And I didn't realize that I was bottling these things up, but to have a therapist and to go get help on the mental side of things was the best decision I could have made. I always hear a lot of people saying, well, you were a professional athlete or you made a ton of money or you got the nice house, nice cars, like clothes and things like that. And it always reminds me of like people being out of touch with what reality is for some people. And I think a lot of guys, I know a lot of guys struggle with the fact of like having all those things, but being able to look in the mirror at the end of the day and be proud of who they are. Plenty of guys struggle with that, you know, when they do have all of these things in their possession, but the game is over, they continue to try to fill the void of what they're missing within themselves with those nice things. And you know, it comes to a point where you look in the mirror and you're just not happy with yourself. You're not happy with the progress you've made. You're not happy with who you are as a person or what you stand for. And that's really where I was. You know, I was in a space of like really frustrated that I didn't feel like I grew as a man or as a person to the extent that I wanted to while I played, just being completely honest. And it wasn't that I was trying not to, but you don't really have the time to realize what you're missing out on until you really sit with yourself post career when you have all of this this time that you're not at the facility or you know diving in the playbooks or watching film. This was the first time that I was in that mode of really hearing what was going on in my mind. From there, I just started doing the work, man. Like I said, I started therapy, extensive therapy, like, you know, every day, two hours a day talking to a therapist. I started journaling. I started meditating. I started just really trying to take control back over my mind. You know, I wanted to know why I was having these certain thoughts, certain feelings, why I was feeling depressed, why I was feeling anxious, what was making me have these thoughts. So I really started getting into that stuff. And 
learning about myself all over again. It sounds crazy, but it's real. You know, I really started challenging myself. I talk about, you know, my cold tub, my cold tub journey. I've been cold plunging for the last two years. I've been going to hot yoga for the last two years, really putting myself and my mind in situations that I know my mind doesn't want me to be in. But I was in the stage of taking back control of my thoughts, you know, and why I reference the cold tub is like it gets so uncomfortable. You know, the water's 39 degrees. And at first your your body and your mind's going to tell you you need to get out. And, you know, two years ago, I would dip in for 30 seconds and then hop out. And I, now I'm at the stage where I can control my mind. I can control my breath. And I'm in there for six minutes. And it's so rewarding to to reap the benefits of being able to control your mind. And I will say that I didn't have that power, you know. So when I say I started doing therapy and all these these little modalities that help me control the mind all over again, I'm now at the stage where I can reap those benefits and really be one within myself. You know, I don't feel like I'm constantly struggling to control my thoughts or I'm constantly struggling to, you know, be positive or whatever. I just feel like I have the right things in place to help me get back on track when I am off track. And I was talking to my therapist the other day about the progress that we've made when it comes to the mind and how I've been operating. And she said something that was really important. She said, you've done a good job of finding what works and doing it on purpose. And that is so powerful to me because I think a lot of us can implement that in our daily lives find what works and do it on purpose. If you know that this makes you happy or this makes you feel good and it's adding to who you want to be as a person, do those things every single day that you get up. You know, I know that breath work makes my my mind calm. I know that breath work sets me on the right path for the day. I know that cold plunging makes my body feel good. It makes my mind feel good. It puts me in control. I know that hot yoga is a release for me, that I'm going to walk out of there and I'm going to feel great the next day. So why would I not do those things if I know that it's what is good for me? I know that working out is great for me. You know, do those things on purpose, find what works and do it on purpose. So fast forward again to how we got here. As I was going through therapy and as we started to make progress, I felt like I wanted to share my story. I felt like there's so many guys and girls and athletes around the world, everyone that can gain something from hearing my story. And so I was always told in these therapy sessions, man, you should talk more. You should speak more like you really have a lot of great insight. And, you know, to me, if you know me, I've always been someone who is a little shy sometimes, you know, I like to listen more than I speak. And I think there's power in that. I think that a lot of times I can be a little too quiet, but it's because I'm observing and I'm listening before I say things. And I love that feature about me, but I also think that I do have a lot of input that I would like to speak on. So while I'm in therapy, I'm getting the urge to want to help people. And, you know, For the Underdogs has became that. For the Underdogs, the name in itself is for people that don't have the blueprint. I feel called to help those people. I was told that I would be a funnel for people to expand their lives. And that's an honor to me. To be a funnel for everyone to expand their lives, that's an honor. That is the most selfless thing that someone has told me and one of the greatest compliments I've gotten, to be honest. But for the underdogs, it's for people that don't have the blueprint, that don't feel like they've been heard or seen or, you know, don't feel like they're at the top of the list to get picked for something. That is what this platform was created for. And that is how it came about, you know, me being able to be at a place that I really want to help people and really want to share my story and the ups and downs and, 
you know, I think a lot of times we hear about everyone sharing their success stories, but then we don't get the gritty part of it. Like there's a gritty part to all of this, you know, there's a reason why I'm here in front of this microphone. I did all the work. I'm still doing the work. I want to share the gritty part. I want to normalize being gritty and having having to, you know, come back from life, real life situations. Like so many times we just get the successful story and that's not, it's just not realistic. It, it serves people this fake picture of what life really is. And, you know, to me, I think I know that this platform is, I know that this platform is helping people actually come to terms with real life things. And that's the, that's my whole goal is to share stuff, normalize it, and then grow from it. That is what it is. I feel like this platform is just going to keep getting bigger and bigger. You know, I'm super grateful for just to reflect on it a little bit. I'm super grateful to be at 10 episodes. I feel like there's been times where, you know, I had to figure out, do I feel like shooting an episode? Am I putting myself first or am I just, you know, trying to get the episodes off for the sake of being consistent for the audience? And that's when I take a step away. You know, if there's weeks in between that I haven't put something out, it's because I'm taking a step away for me and I am getting back to the things that work for me. And this is something that every time I get back to it, I realize, and I've said this before, I am my own audience with this because it's super therapeutic. And a lot of times I listen back to the words that I say and I get inspiration from these things because I'm not, this isn't just an act for me. This is actually who I am and the space that I want to be in. That being said, I feel like the route that we've taken is a special route. You know, I know that this isn't clickbait and I'm not looking to be clickbait. I'm looking for the crowd that really can be honest with themselves and they're looking for conversations of substance and to really grow from hearing me speak. Like, that's what I'm looking for. And I've I've had a couple of people reach out to me and it's funny because I think a lot of the episodes have sideswiped people, you know. Um, I've heard people say, like, I thought it was going to be more on the funny side. I thought you were going to be, you know, joking and things like that. And that's all well and good. Like, if you know me, you know I love to laugh. I, You know, I am a jokester at times. That's what I, I love to do. I love to make people laugh and have a good time. But also, there's a part of me that's also feeling like there's enough jokesters on the internet. There's enough comedians on the internet, especially in a black community. I feel like when do we start to show that we can be educators or facilitators of great conversation? That's the lane I'm in. You know, there will be a time where, you know, there's laughs and things on this podcast that, you know, I hope that people find the conversations helpful, but also I'm showing a different side and I'm I'm so comfortable in the lane that I'm in to be facilitating these conversations and to be educating. Like I said, it's for a different crowd. And I appreciate the people that do listen and they want they want to hear the jokes and they want the laughter and things like that. But I do think that the conversations that we have are helpful and they're they're needed in the world, given where the world is right now. I just don't feel like there's enough of this. So that is completely the lane in which I want to be in. And as we continue to build this thing out and and branch out, more of my personality will show. Of course, when there's guests, more of my personality will show. But there's just times that I want to share real conversations and real thoughts that I'm having. And I hope that people understand that, you know, it's not always going to be about therapy and things like that. But also there are people that need to hear it and there are people that need to normalize it and, and be comfortable with it. And I think that we can make the world a better place with that. So as we cap off season one, I really just want to say thank you to everybody that's been tuning in, everybody that's, you know, 
reposted the podcast. Everyone that's bought a cap, a Feather Underdogs cap, we just released these as our first merch drop for the whole first season. And I just want to say thank you. I'm truly grateful to have this platform and speak to you guys. I think that as we continue to grow, it's only going to get bigger. Season two has already been in the works and I'm super excited to share it with you guys. But thank you for all the support and I'll talk to you guys soon.